The International Festival of Arts and Ideas is created and produced on the traditional lands of the Mohegan, Mashantucket Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill Pawgusset, Niantic, and the Quinnipiac, in the land we all call home, Connecticut. We hope that from wherever you are, you take a moment to acknowledge and honor the native people whose land you are on and the history of the place you are in. The International Festival of Arts and Ideas stands in solidarity with black and brown communities and other groups who are targeted and abused by unjust systems of oppression. We support all movements working to decenter white voices and dismantle white supremacy. We are actively seeking to dismantle systemic racism and we raise our voices with those in our community who are already engaged in this vital work. We commit to working alongside you to create transformative change in New Haven and in our global community. Hello, and welcome to Yale Repertory Theater, and to those watching on the NBC Telemundo virtual stage at the 27th Annual International Festival of Arts and Ideas. My name is Jason Mancini, and I'm the Executive Director of Connecticut Humanities. Connecticut Humanities is so proud to partner with the International Festival of Arts and Ideas to bring more than a dozen talks, ranging from black food to radical liberation to today's talk exploring climate change to Connecticut and broadcast around the world. This event is also presented with support from Seabury at Home. And finally, a quick thank you to the festival's marquee sponsors who are helping to bring you more than 200 events this June. Community Foundation of Greater New Haven, Yale University, National Endowment for the Arts, Connecticut Office of the Arts, City of New Haven, and of course, my home base of Connecticut Humanities. There are many amazing events to come, including events on the New Haven Green and four more Ideas Talks. For the first time, two of those talks will be presented in Spanish with English translation, including welcoming American hero Dolores Huerta here in New Haven this Saturday, June 25th. Make sure to check out the full list of programming of arts at arts, artidea.org. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce today's talk, The Power of Choice in Climate Change. Please join me in welcoming New York Times bestselling author, Paul Greenberg. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, it's great to be here in my home stomping grounds of uh, Connecticut. Um, so, Maybe you know me, maybe you don't know me, probably you don't know me. Um, I'm generally not famous. I am often, I'm, well, I'm kind of fish famous. And um, uh, if you, who here has ever been fishing? Raise your hand if you've ever been fishing. Okay, so pretty fishy crowd. Raise your hand if you eat fish once a week. Okay, pretty fishy. Raise your hand if you've ever gone for an entire year where you've eaten fish for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Okay, I win that one, He's hands down. So um, I wrote this book, Four Fish, and it was a James Beard winner, and it was bestseller, blah, blah, blah. Um, and, you know, it went on to achieve a certain kind of fame. There was a front line, there was a TED Talk, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I'm going to talk about fish today, um, because I'm fish famous. Um, but I'm going to also try to kind of connect it to some other things, because as this book came out about 10 years ago, I went on to write an entire marine trilogy, believe it or not, all about fish. And, um, but I realized as I sort of kind of worked through my fish fame issues um, that there were much bigger ha, -ha fish to fry. And um, as I kind of moved on through my life to other things, I realized that you cannot talk about fish, you cannot talk about food without talking about climate. So I'll be kind of mushing these two books together today, um, Four Fish, which I wrote about 10 years ago, and The Climate Diet, which just came out recently. So, for, forgive me, I will just do a little bit of fish to begin with. So um, I grew up fishing. This is me with a 28-pound striped bass that I caught off of uh, Montauk a number of years ago. Um, but most of my fishing was done right here in Long Island Sound. And when I was a kid, um, these fish were kind of the fish that I would 
possibly be able to find. Um, I don't know about you guys, but I was a terrible athlete. Yes, I did my soccer, hockey, lacrosse, but I stunk at all of it. I still have the splinters in my butt from all the bench riding that I did. But what I really, really loved was fishing. And my team was this team. So, you know, you might have soccer in the fall, hockey in the winter, lacrosse in the spring. But to me, this was a whole multiplicity of seasons. So, St. Patrick's Day, when the Forsythia bloom, you'd have winter flounder. April, uh, when the dogwood started to come out, you'd start to have um, mackerel into Long Island Sound. And then in May, when the lilacs blooms, weak fish. And then finally, you'd have bluefish into June and striped bass in July. Just an amazing panoply of things. So I fished and fished and fished, and that was the way that I sort of lived my life. Um, but I often point out that, so a boy's desire to fish is inversely pr proportional to his desire to eventually pursue a mate. And so as I reached my teenage years, I fished less and less. Now, of course, once you've gone through your 20s into your 30s, that equation starts to reverse, and I came back to fishing again. And when I came back to fishing and I came back to Long Island Sound, instead of finding this, this is what I found that a lot of the fish had disappeared from that sort of regular rotation. And then um, I found oftentimes that when I went to fish markets, and who here likes to go to a fish market? Raise your hand if you like to go to a fish market. So it's really interesting, right? It's, it's, like, it's very diverse. It's, very, it's much more interesting than going, say, to a butcher shop. But nevertheless, I found that when I went to fish markets, I kept seeing this sort of repetition of four fish again and again and again. Um, there'd always be something sort of red and steaky that you'd make into sushi, and that would be your tuna. There'd be something pink and succulent that would be your salmon that you'd bake or smoke. There'd be something white and flaky that you'd fry, and there may be a wholeish fish that you throw on a grill and you call that a bass. When I told people who were not fish people about this, they didn't understand what I was talking about. And I said, well, it's kind of more like this, right? Because most people don't really understand the panoply of species out there in the ocean. They really just think of it as sort of three, four pieces of meat. And so when I explained that to them, they'd like, oh yeah, I know those fish. Well, they know those pieces of meat. And when I started looking into even more deeply, I realized that this was a trend that humanity has done before. You go back 15, 20,000 years and you look at our archeological record and you'll see dozens and dozens of different mammals that we ate. But telescope to the age of Christ and the beginning of the modern era and you start to see just this four, right? Cows, pigs, sheep, and goats. Telescope even further into, as we start to develop more animal husbandry and you look at birds and you see, again, four, turkeys, ducks, chicken, and geese. So all of this was starting to happen in the ocean, and it was really disturbing me. And it was really starting to make me feel like, oh my God, are we gonna do the same kind of homogenization in the ocean as we did on land? And I think, yes, that's, we're heading in that direction. Now, because this is a, a talk that we're really gonna talk about um, climate in, I've made a small substitution. There's a special uh, climate disaster guest star, which is the shrimp. So we'll get into that in a little bit. Okay, so. How did we get to this point? How do we get this point where we're really narrowing down what we eat from the sea? Well, this is a big part of it. Um, you look at this graph, and this shows the trend of the amount of fish that we've taken out of the sea every single year since the 1950s, 1940s. We've basically quadrupled the number of fish we take from the ocean from about 20 million metric tons to over 80 million metric tons. That's the equivalent of the human weight of China taken out of the sea every year. That's just wild. But then there's this other trend going on, which is the farming of fish and seafood, which is something very, very new. You see it just starting to begin right over here, right? There's almost no aquaculture at all. And we're now to the point where nearly half of what we eat from the sea is farmed. That's a huge epical transformation that we haven't seen since we came out of the caves 10,000 years ago. So now we're taking the equivalent of two Chinas out of the sea, both in farming um, and in wild harvest. And um, just out of curiosity, where do we stand in all of that? These are the top farmers of seafood in the world, going from greatest China, which is far, far over here, India down here. Notice we're not even on the map. We, as a nation, farm less seafood than um, Myanmar at this point. So sort of interesting. Okay, so that's what we got. We got, our, we got our, these four creatures that are sort of primarily uh, part of our lives more and more. And so in the book Four Fish, I kind of traced these four creatures. And again, if we had a little bit more time and we weren't climate, weren't pressing on our shoulders so much, I might go into a little more detail, but I'll try and blow through our four creatures to set up the larger talk that I want to do about climate. So let's start with our first fish, the, the salmon. So um, there are um, basically 
uh, six species of salmon that we deal with in this country that we had had or have in this country. Um, the one that we really focus on is this one, Salmo salar, um, the salmon that jumps literally from the Latin. Um, but we've uh, farmed this fish to a certain de to a degree that people s that we've gone through about 20 generations of selective breeding to the point where it's really some people say it's almost another species, Salmo domesticus. How did we get to that point? Well, this chart kind of lays it out. Um, so this is um, our fishing habits over the course of the last say 100 years or so. And what's really interesting is you see these dips happen during the two world wars. This is in terms of um, this is fishing in the North Atlantic. Now, why do we have those dips? Well, who wants to go fishing when there are submarines in your waters? So these big dips here, I often say that if fish were to write the history of the last 100 years, they would call this re great reprieve number one and great reprieve number two. Um, but after um, the great reprieve number two was over, you see this, again, booming of fishing and then dropping off, dropping off, dropping off. Because what happened is in the wake of World War II, there was just this massive exploitation of the ocean where people were like, the, the land has been despoiled in Europe, let's get out there, let's catch some fish. And one of the things that they did during that time was that they discovered the two places in the world where all Atlantic salmon gather to feed off of the coast of Greenland and off of the Faroes. And once they discovered that, they fished those populations and they fished them extremely hard to the point of commercial um, extinction. Now, the other thing that went on is this phenomenon. So here's our home state of Connecticut here. Every dot on this map is a dam. There are over 4,000 dams in the state of Connecticut. I often say this is why people in Connecticut are so uptight. Um, their chi is blocked. If only we could unblock Connecticut's chi. No, but seriously, all these dams were built over the course of the um, last two or 300 years, some of them for completely now nonsense reasons, um, some of them to make ice ponds so that you could harvest ice, some of them to grind corn and so forth. And over the course of blocking all of those passageways for fish, and anadromous fish to migrate from the ocean to the land, um, inland rather, um, we eradicated scores and scores of runs of different fish, particularly salmon. So we started uh, looking into farming them. And now why did farming salmon, why did, was that so successful? Well, this is four fish, the larval edition. Um, and you can see that salmon have this unique adaptation, which is they, ha they hatch out of a very nutrient-rich egg which means that they can absorb all those nutrients in the first few weeks of life, and then you can transition them directly onto industrial feed. And what that has meant is that this has become the cow of the sea. This has become the farmed animal that you can farm anywhere, and including um, in uh, Chile. Um, this picture was taken this in Chile, in Puerto Montt, where salmon um, is one of the biggest things in the economy there. There are no salmonids native to the southern hemisphere. In fact, we've created actually an invasive species problem introducing all of these salmon to that region. Now, the other thing that goes on with salmon is you have to feed them something. And in the early days of farming salmon, it could take as many as six pounds of wild fish uh, to grow a single pound of salmon. Now they've gotten it back down to about two pounds because they're actually feeding them a lot of soy. But we're doing so much salmon farming at this point um, that we're um, still taking a tremendous portion of the sea and just feeding it to other fish. Something like, I don't know, 20 to 30% of the world catch just gets ground up and turned into fish pellets. And then there's another thing going on, which is we've dipped our toe into genetic modification. So uh, salmon um, that we've selectively bred over 20 generations now grows twice as fast. But there's a company based in Massachusetts called Aqua Bounty that has taken a Chinook salmon from the West Coast and planted that gene a growth gene from this fish into that fish, and then taken an ocean pout regulator protein and snapped it onto that to make a fish that goes twice as fast as the already twice as fast growing selectively bred salmon. Now, all this is going on in the context of us having huge continued problems with um, nature and with our confrontation of preserving nature. So this is Bristol Bay in Alaska. It's one of the most productive fisheries on Earth, one of the productive salmon fisheries on Earth. Um, it's so productive that you can go fishing in Bristol Bay with this fly, which is called a flesh fly. And it actually, what it does is it imitates a piece of flesh falling off of a salmon carcass. And I went fishing with this flesh fly in Bristol Bay, and I caught this amazing rainbow trout, and it was so powerful, so full of salmon energy that it slipped out of the guide's hands, <laughs> and it kept going, and it kept going, and it kept going. 
So this is not photoshopped. Um, it's an amazing, powerful fish. And it's just an amazing fishery, just amazing, amazing productivity where there's not only sport fishing, but an amazing commercial fishery. And there are very handsome men who fish under rainbows. Um, <laughs> and it's an amazing system, because look at it. It's undammed, unpolluted, wonderful place. But this is what, um, until recently, was coming down the pike. What would have been the largest copper and gold mine in North America plopped down right on top of the world's largest sam uh, sockeye salmon run. And it was kind of this ridiculous situation. I got very involved in the campaign to stop what was called the pebble mine. But amidst all of this, then you'd have like this crazy stuff going on. So it was a project that was, um, it was effectively stopped under the Obama administration, but then Scott Pruitt, under Trump, got it going again. And then amidst all of this crazy stuff where Trump is getting the, tr the thing going again, his son, Donald Trump Jr., takes Don, Don the Three, and they go fishing in Bristol Bay, and he says, um, if you, he says, if you haven't read about the journey these amazing fish make and the transformation they make in their life, you should because it's unbelievable. And meanwhile, his father was going ahead and trying to wreck the whole fishery. We pointed this out in this op-ed, took it right from Instagram and put it in there. And guess what? We've, we won. Um, this past month, we're about, it's an amazing thing. And it's not, you know, I'm just a small part of it, but it's an amazing campaign to really try to stop what would have been the greatest, most egregious damage to fisheries that we'd have seen. So, you know, the only thing we have to do to make sure that this really goes through is to lock him up. Now, um, I have no idea who the internet artist who made this was. Please, if, you, if you're out there, come forward. I want to credit you. But it's just, a, anyway. All that's by way of saying we did a great thing, but then no sooner had um, we did this great thing than I looked at the temperatures in the Bering Sea. And you can see this is getting to the point where it's gonna be too hot for salmon in general. So that's when I started to realize I can't just do my usual four fish talk, I have to do a climate talk as well. So that brings us to our next fish, which is the shrimp. Okay, so I mean, we all love our shrimp cocktail, et cetera, et cetera, but it's just about the worst seafood choice you could make. It's extremely, extremely fuel intensive to grow shrimp. And I would say that, so shrimp is the most consumed seafood in America. We eat about 15 pounds of seafood a year. In this country, four pounds of it is shrimp. And most of it is farmed coming to us from places like this. So I took this picture in Vietnam. This is a mangrove forest. And this is really the way native habitat should look on the coast. But this is the way it looks after shrimp farms move in. Just an incredible, incredible devastation. So it's a double climate, double whammy, because uh, it's extremely carbon intensive to grow shrimp, but also mangrove forests are actually three to four times more effective as carbon sequesters than tropical rainforests. And so when you cut them down, put in a shrimp farm, you're basically making um, a, cl a, a, a carbon explosion when you had a carbon sink in the first place. And of course, wild shrimp is not, not much better either. Um, shrimp uh, are caught to the, by, the bycatch to shrimp ratio is about anywhere from three to one to 10 to one. So as much as 10 pounds of wild other stuff caught and killed in the process of harvesting just one pound of shrimp. So that's shrimp. All right, my next fish is this, is, is this sort of white flaky thing that's much more of a New England staple, and that's cod, okay? So cod was once this sort of amazing kind of backbone of New England and, um, and North Atlantic trade. I took this picture in Norway. And you still have these amazing cod drying operations um, in um, Lof Lofoten Island off of Norway. It was a fundamental part of triangular trade where um, dried fish were produced here in New England, sent down to actually feed the slaves that produced all the other products that were then sent to, to England. So it was a huge part of it. Um, but in the modern era, um, those codfish was really part of this great staple of American cuisine, the filet of fish sandwich. Um, the filet fish sandwich actually has a sort of interesting provenance. It was originally um, proposed by a franchise owner in Cleveland because on Fridays nobody came into the shop. Nobody came into McDonald's. Why? They were Catholic. And so he proposed, what about a fish sandwich? Ray Kroc at the time said, no, you know, I think I want to do a pineapple sandwich and we're going to call it the hula burger. And Ray Kroc, the other guy was like, well, I don't know. I kind of think my sandwich is going to sell better. So they went head to head. And um, guess who won? The filet of fish And it was originally made out of halibut, uh, but it was too expensive. It was, came in at 60 cents a sandwich. They wanted 25 cents a sandwich, so they switched to cod. But soon, we'd overfished cod to the point where it now has to come from Alaska pollock. 
Alaska pollock is this invisible fish where we catch something like two or three billion pounds of it a year to put into our filet of fish sandwiches. It's also in, if you've ever had a, a um, California roll, um, I don't know if anyone's a fan of Curb Your Enthusiasm, but you might remember that one of the reasons that Larry David breaks up with um, Cheryl, and, uh, his wife, is because during sex, he can't stop talking about the difference between fake crab and real crab. Um, <laughs> fake crab is Pollock, and it's in that sandwich. So that, you know, we moved on to that. And then we moved on to yet another fish, which is the um, tilapia. So the tilapia is this fish that is, is farmed, it uh, dies if it goes over 60 degrees, but people just don't seem to notice. And so we have these ads like this. I love this. Gorton's fisherman, there he is in his oil skins going out to the Grand Banks and he's going to bring you back some tilapia. When meanwhile, tilapia dies, as I say, um, in water that goes below 60 degrees. There's no way the Gorton's fisherman is going to bring you back tilapia. It's coming to us from China. It's coming to us from Ecuador. It is not an American fish, but we've become so inured to the fact that we have these situations where we can't feed ourselves with our own fish that we accept somehow this mashup between the, go the, go the Gorton's fisherman and... Uh, and tilapia. And then there's the other very consumed white fish in America, this fish, um, the Pangasius catfish, which is actually the sixth most consumed fi seafood in America, but you have no idea that you're actually eating it. And then my last fish in the four fish part of this talk is tuna. And tuna is really kind of the end of the line as far as where we're going with fisheries because um, f tuna are composed of um, basically these four species. It's a very global fish. It's really coming to us from far beyond our shores. Um, the management organizations that manage these things are these vast um, ocean sweeping organizations. We're in the territory of what's called the ICAT, International Con Convention for the Conservation of Atlantic Tunas. My good friend, the conservationist uh, Carl Safina, calls it the international conspiracy to catch all the tuna. Um, so we've, we're, we're really bumping up against that last wild food. And yeah, we're trying to farm tuna as well, but it can take, unlike salmon, which was, we're down to two pounds of wild fish to produce one pound of farmed salmon, it can take as many t as 20 pounds of wild fish to feed one pound of farmed tuna. Why? Because tuna are actually warm-blooded. They swim at 20, miles, 20 to 40 miles an hour. They're just more, much more wildlife uh, than they are uh, food. So that brings us to this next bit, which I'll try and go through rather quickly so that we can have a little bit of a discussion. So what should we eat? Um, that very much was the subject of this last book that I wrote called The Climate Diet. And I would say that, you know, in spite of all the sort of things that I'm saying about the ocean, how the oceans are in trouble and so forth, I believe that the oceans can be very much part of an eating climate solution. And it takes a little bit of explanation to get there. I mean, when you look at it, so this is sort of land food America, and this is seafood America in terms of both harvest and eating tendency. Actually, to tell you the truth, I stole this from the New York Times. This is who voted for Trump, and this is who voted for Clinton. So <laughs> excuse that. But what's pretty interesting is when you look at the economics of this whole thing, we as a country spend $5 billion a year just on corn, which we don't eat, by the way. We just feed to cows, pigs, and chickens. We spend $1 billion on all fish combined. So a huge skewing against the ocean. And all that land food is actually very bad for the ocean. Um, we've all seen this from on the windows of our airplanes. I think I took this from flying to California. But what's feeding all of this is this. This is a mountain of, of fertilizer in the Midwest. I remember seeing this vast mountain of fertilizer in this totally blighted agricultural industrial town. And I remember, I didn't even know where I was. It was somewhere in Minnesota. And I asked the farmer, like, what is this? What, what's the name of this town? He says, oh, this town? It's Walnut Grove, as in Little House on the Prairie, Walnut Grove. Like, if Pa could see this, he would be disgusted. Um, what does all this mean for the ocean? It means this. Um, huge dead zones um, created by the influx of nitrogen waste that goes into the Gulf of Mexico, all over water base. I mean, here on Long Island Sound, we have dead zones. Overnitrification leads to... Um, too much algal blooms, eventually those algal blooms get consumed by bacteria, which suck the oxygen out. It's a big mess. So all these things are also extremely, extremely carbon intensive. Um, you know, a lot of times when people get critical of seafood, they don't look at the whole, whole huge effect of land food. And land food is extremely carbon intensive. And if you look at some of these charts that sort of compare land food with seafood, it's pretty striking. Um, look at cows and, and beef, 27 kilos of CO2 emissions for one kilo of beef. People switch, say, become vegetarian, and they say, oh, I'll just eat the cheese. Well, cheese, 13.5 kilos of CO2. Chickens are not bad at 6.9, but look at fish. Look at wild fish, about 1.6. You 
Now, lentils are the, seem like the really good way to go, and we should be all much more plant-focused. But then look at mussels. Mussels are actually a great carbon deal. So in looking ahead to sort of what we should be eating, you know, originally, I think in this country, for the last 40, 50 years, we've been in this industrial diet mode, where it's mostly this stuff that we're eating as the mainstay, yeah, a little bit of vegetable, a little bit of fish, a little bit of olive oil. Um, I think those of us who watch what we eat have really started to think much more about being on a Mediterranean diet pattern, um, where we're really putting vegetables in the center of the plate, moving this off to the side, and so forth. But what I'm advocating for is what I call a pescatarian diet. Um, hopefully this will ch get trademarked and I'll never have to write another book again, um, but probably won't happen. Now, what would the pescatarian diet look like? Well, we might do things, do eat things like anchovies, which by and large we're feeding to salmon, but we could eat directly. Very low in carbon, except in fact extremely low, about the lowest carbon um, emissions for any seafood out there, except for maybe mussels. Very high in omega-3s. We could also look at our friends, the oyster, the mussel, the clam, and seaweed. Um, the, some of you probably know Brent Smith, famously farming kelp here in Long Island Sound, filters the water. All of these things are also very high in omega-3s, very low in carbon emissions. And then there's the aquaculture question, looking ahead. So what would the farmed fish of the future, the ideal, be? Well, it would be feed smart. In other words, it would do things that present farm fish aren't doing. Um, it could make use of eating algae, which we now can make feed from algae, but it, we can also use food waste to produce things that are called black soldier fly larvae, which actually are very nutritious for fish, and it's a way of converting waste into something that we would want to eat. We want something that's fast growing because the longer you grow something in the water, the more carbon it takes. We want something that's adaptable, and as I think a lot of us are aware of, we're now looking to offshore for wind production, but a lot of these offshore wind stations could also potentially be places where we could grow kelp, where we could grow mussels, oysters, all those kinds of things, so it could potentially be a win-win situation. And ultimately, we probably do want that oily fish profile, just a slight pitch for another book I wrote called The Omega Principle, all about omega-3s, and I do think, yes, it's important. And then, this is the latest kind of interesting development, what about no fish at all? Um, there actually are a lot of products coming onto the market that um, uh, either cell-based growing of fish or, or sort of vegetable simulacrums of fish, just like you have your Impossible Burger. There are a number of products on the market now which are plant-based and yet do fairly well simulate fish and shrimp. So in conclusion, you know, I think what we're looking for is more of this. Um, I think we're wanting to move that more to the center of the plate. We want to move away from the large predatory fish. We want to move away from those really high carbon intensive land animals that we're eating. And we want to come in balance with our planet. And to me, if we eat this way, that's one step all of us can take to be better citizens of the planet. So that's my talk, and, but now I think we could talk. I believe I'll be, we'll be joined by John. Hi, everyone. <laughs> that was fascinating, Paul. Thank you. Um, I'm John Dankosky. I uh, work for Science Friday, and I've spent a lot of time working here in Connecticut on environmental issues, and I'm really glad to talk about this stuff. <laughs> I, love, I love to talk about climate change, not that it's my favorite topic, but I also love to talk about eating. Yep. Help us reconcile a little bit more clearly this idea of eating a land-based diet versus a seafood-based diet, given the fact that the seafood-based diet that we mostly can have right now is as destructive as the one that you, you painted. I mean, yes, it would be great to eat anchovies more, but most of the anchovies are being caught and ground up into fish food or being put into some sort of a capsule for us. How do we get to a point where we can actually have a sustainable pescatarian <laughs> trademark diet? Yes, trademark diet. Um, <laughs> well, so first of all, there's no shortage of clams, mussels, and oysters. And those are a really good thing to have at the center of your plate. Um, I often say in other talks that um, a big swap we could make is instead of cocktails, we have half shells. So mm -hmm. you've already got a drink in your hand. Are you really going to notice if you swap out um, a half sh oh, star on the half shell versus? So that stuff is all readily available. And yeah, you know, I think you on your show have talked a lot about can we really vote with our four? Can we mm -hmm. really move the needle forward? So there's a limit to that. Um, there are all sorts of sort of legislative things that we need to do. But I do think we've already seen 
um, a very positive, the, the, the whole trend towards oysters has been great. It's been great for Long Island Sound, but what underpinned it was the Clean Water Act. Before mm -hmm. 1972, all we did was see downward, downward trends in shellfish production. Now we're really seeing it. Now to your point about the anchovies, this is an area where we need work by chefs. We need to figure out how to make those fish of higher value, put them at the center of the plate. Um, there are chefs doing that kind of work. We're not quite there yet, but there are cultures that really do emb em embrace herring, sardines, even, well, in herring, I should say, you know, most, 80% uh, of the main herring catch ends up in lobster traps. Mm. So what about a main herring roll? There. <laughs> you know, pick the bones out first. Well, I, but I think that there's, there's another piece of it, this, this too, right, is that when we talk about many of the fish, both that we love to consume, whether it's the, you know, almost farm to extinction bluefin tuna that would cost so much in your plate at a sushi restaurant, to many of the dishes that we talk about here, including oysters, it's a rich person's food. Oysters weren't always, but if you <coughs> walk downtown a block or so, you could get a dozen oysters for three fifty or four dollars a pop. Yeah, and that doesn't seem sustainable from the standpoint of actually feeding people. Yeah, well, I mean, I go back a little bit to that disproportionate amount of um, American subsidy that goes into land food versus seafood. Mm -hmm. Remember, five million, five billion dollars for just corn and one billion for all fish. So the reason our land food is so cheap is because it's being subsidized. Now, I do not want to encourage subsidizing of uh, more vessels out there. Like one of the things that got us into the fisheries crisis in the process uh, was subsidizing fuel costs and so forth. And the European Union to this day oversubsidizes their fishing fleets is one of the reasons that the Mediterranean is one of the most overfished places in the planet. But I do think on the consumer end, there's a place for subsidy. Um, I do think, for example, there's a few um, what are called community-supported fisheries um, that are doing work trying to connect fishermen to, sc fishermen to schools. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, why aren't delicious Alaska salmon, which, by the way, X vessel from the boat in Alaska are selling for 89 cents a pound? Mm -hmm. Why isn't that going into our school system where we know, we have scientific evidence that a high, diet high in omega-3s for young people actually builds brains? So why isn't that, you know, do we want to invest in brains? May, you know, the previous <laughs> president maybe doesn't, but I would hope that future presidents will. The, making this sustainable for the fishermen, the people who do this work, is also important. I know <laughs> something that you've, you've covered a bit recently and that I've certainly covered throughout a, a big chunk of my career is this battle uh, between the lobstering industry in New England and climate change, the battle between lobstermen and big species like the right whale, mm -hmm. we see this, this problem where there's a, there's a window that's been caused by climate change of about maybe a decade or so where people who fish lobster in the Gulf of Maine have a chance to make all the money they're ever going to make because the, the lobsters used to be down here too and yeah. now they're up there and then pretty soon they're going to be up in Canada. Yeah. But right now those fishermen have to do it and so they're getting a lot of lobster out of the water, yeah. but it's causing problems for other species. It's maybe not sustainable. How do we make something that actually works for the people who do the work of going and getting this stuff out of the ocean? Okay, so let's put the lobster for the second course. The first course okay. is generally how do we put money in fishermen's pockets in a fair way. One of the things that, good things, COVID silver lining, was um, the emergence of direct-to-consumer seafood consumption. Because remember in the early days of the pandemic when we thought anything that touched any surface was certain death. Um, but so a lot of the businesses like Sitka Salmon Shares, um, a few different community supported fisheries started doing direct consumer seafood. And if you do have that option of subscribing to a community supported fishery, that's a good way to do it because fishermen do see more money in their pockets. Now, on the lobster issue, um, I actually have I just did a piece for a now defunct magazine called Eating Well. Not, no sooner had they published my article than they, I, I drive <laughs> magazines out of business. It's, a, it's one of my hobbies. Um, but anyway, so I did a piece where I spent some time in the Gulf of Maine looking at this lobsters versus right whale issues. Basically the issue is right whales can get entangled in fishing gear and they do get entangled in fishing gears. And there's only about three or 300 or so right whales, North Atlantic right whales left. And they are getting entangled in gear, but there's never been a case, an example, a documented example of right whales in lobster gear. They're getting tangled in ghost gear. 
They're getting tangled possibly in Canadian crab gear, but they are not getting tangled in, in um, Maine lobster gear. When, when you say ghost gear, gear that's left behind that no yeah, one is I tending. Mean, there's so much gear in the water, and you know, right whales are highly migratory. So when they're, and you know, the other thing that's really frankly hitting, getting right whales is, is ship strikes. And that's happening, you know, with jerk offs in there, you know, roaring speedboats and so forth. There was a horrible strike of both a mother and a calf. So I don't think, you know, I do believe, you know, if you look at the history of the Maine lobster industry, it's one of the most fascinating industries as far as the Maine lobster industry at one point almost went the way of every other kind of, you know, fishery. But one of the things that the Maine lobster fishery did was they instituted both a minimum size and a maximum size. So what that meant is that if you catch a big spawning lobster that's over the maximum size, boom, back in the water. If we could do this with every single wild fishery on the planet, there would be no fisheries problem because it's the big spawners that maintain the population. And so one of the reasons for the great success of the main, of the main lobster industry, yes, climate change is causing lobsters to migrate northward, but it's also because of very, very good uh, management. I, I want to say that if you're listening at home or watching this wherever, you can uh, send in a question and we'll try to get to a few of them uh, along the way. If you're here in the audience, I believe on your program there's a QR code and you can send a question up here. It'll show up on my little iPad and hopefully I can ask Paul the, the question there. So please send your questions in. Um, th this idea of changing our diet and helping the planet is something that many people want to do. How big an impact do you think it really has? We, we can maybe talk about all the other types of climate activism yeah. in a moment, but just the activism in your kitchen or at the grocery store, how much of an impact does it really have? Well, so I like to think about it in terms of what drives systems change. And, um, a very, and also I like to talk about it in terms of what causes family arguments. <laughs> um, you know, I think we've all had the experience where we ourselves have been college students or our children come home from college and they're like, I'm not eating the Thanksgiving turkey. I'm done and you suck. And you know, and everyone's like, oh, you're torturing your Aunt Molly. She made the turkey. <laughs> and then, you know, everyone leaves in a huff. Yeah. So, you know, in the, in the climate diet book, I tried to put forth a few sort of modest proposals. And one of them is if we switched from beef to chicken, as a nation, as our primary, you know, we're already kind of trending in that direction. But beef, no matter if it's um, pasture raised or feedlot raised, it's still just a big carbon problem. And I think moving away from beef, even if we could move our meals more towards chicken, that could have a significant impact on things. Um, in terms of systems, though, another sort of system is sort of sort of food adjacent, which is thinking about our kitchens as a place where climate change could really be confronted. And one of the major things that came to my came to light when I was doing climate diet research was how how much of a problem having gas stuff in our mm. kitchens is. So you know, gas is sort of touted as this kind of bad, good alternative to oil, but gas is super leaky, and when it leaks, it's super powerful as a climate um, change gas. Um, so switching over to electric can be really effective. Now, okay, well, what if it's a coal-fired plant that's firing our electric? Well, you can actually switch your electricity provider, and you can now actually shop for an electricity provider that is doing clean energy transfer to your home. So that's when I get excited about systems change. We're changing from gas to electric in our homes, and then we're changing our whole electrical system. Pretty soon, you've got a, a market dynamic that is moving us towards a different kind of economy. That, I think, is something that can have an effect on a macroeconomic scale. But, but getting back to that, that economic piece, as I was talking about the oysters, the $3.25 yeah. oyster that it would be lovely to eat more of. Maybe it's government subsidies that puts more oysters on people's plates. One of the realities of America is that many people have a choice to subscribe to the Alaska salmon fishery and yeah. have them send you uh, frozen fish. Many, many people don't. Yeah. Many people have a, a choice and they can say, I want to retrofit my, my home. I want to go all electric. Hell, I want to put you know, panels on top of the, the house yeah. and, and harvest the sun. But there's an awful lot of people in America who either can't afford to do that, don't own their own homes, are living someplace where they don't have any agency to be able to do that. That's the real systems change, though, is, is getting to all of those folks who can't necessarily make the same sort of decision with their pocketbook. So I do think 
there's, there's certainly true, and we certainly need some sort of larger driver from a government level that's pushing in this direction. But I will say that some of those arguments are a little old. Um, when I live in New York City, when our apartment building um, gas line broke, and we had no gas, there's, you know, what are we going to do? Rub two sticks together? I bought a two-top electric range, induction electric range, um, for $150, and now it's pretty much all I cook on. Now, $150 for some homes, that's a lot, but it's not a thousand. It's not a giant Viking range. Um, and what's great about it, you know, just to kind of r remind what's good about an electric range. When you cook on gas, 50% of the heat energy goes into the air. Mm -hmm. When you cook on induction electric, something like 90% of the electric goes into your food, the energy goes into your food. So it's just a huge, huge decision. Now, going back to the question of you know, the, the expensive fish and so forth, any American can get wild Alaska salmon in a can. I mean, it's just, frankly, there's no such thing pretty much as farmed canned salmon. It's all wild and it's all good, and it's all high in omega-3s, and it's all pretty darn cheap. Um, any uh, American, I think, can afford mussels, which tend to price out at about three, three to four bucks a pound. So those things can be done. Um, it takes a little bit of sort of cooking adjustment. You know, I'm a big <laughs> fish cake maker of a wild Alaska salmon. I'm a big mussel maker. Um, so we can do these things, but we have to learn how to do them. Well, we have to learn how to do them. We have to want to, to cook them. Yep. We have to want to eat them. I mean, so many people I know who are part of this world, our, our friend Bun Lai, who had this great restaurant, Mia Sushi, for so many years here in New Haven. You know, he advocates eating bugs and grubs that many people don't want to eat. But not everyone's even on fish, right? Not even everyone's on mussels right now. No, I mean, you know, when you look at the American diet, we eat 200 pounds of land food meat a year and 15 pounds of seafood. So we've already eating a lot of that stuff. I mean, I don't know. I think the cheapest way and the best way is to be plant-centered. Um, I, I, I don't, you know, I was vegan for a couple of years. Um, I've kind of veered away from it. Actually, it was funny during the pandemic. I don't know, anybody found themselves reading books about restaurants during the pandemic? Because you couldn't go out anywhere. And, and I remember um, I read um, Kitchen Confidential by Anthony Bourdain, and he has a great line in there. And he goes, ugh, the vegetarians. I hate the vegetarians. And don't get me started on the Hezbollah splinter faction, the vegans. <laughs> and, 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 and I realized, you know, at a certain point that there is something oppressive about veganism. I mean, I, I've done it, and I'm yeah. mostly vegan at home. But I think we have to be careful, especially in this time of, like, extreme political polarization. So I actually think the real way to work this is, is through health. Mm. Um, it's cheaper to eat a plant-based diet and it's healthier. And the health outcomes, you know, it's always tricky doing um, health studies of diet. But, you know, take, I have spent a number of years wading through diet studies. I teach a course in Crete for Northeastern on the Mediterranean diet. So I've looked at this, and, the me, you know, time and time again, the Mediterranean diet is singled out by US News and World Report as the most healthy diet. And what is the Mediterranean diet about? It's about minuscule amounts of animal protein, large amounts of legumes, large amounts of fresh vegetables, large amounts of whole grains. We all could do that, and we could all do that affordably. We do have some questions coming in. I think Glenn has this question. Can consuming invasive fish species and locally abundant fish have a benefit to climate change and local fisheries? Are there local examples you can share? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. You know, the invasive orism sort of rises and fall, and you mentioned our friend Ban Lai, who's, you know, invasive war number one. Yes. Um, but there are examples um, locally, um, or well, let's say regionally, um, blue catfish um, have invaded the Chesapeake, a very affordable fish that um, is very tasty. So eating that would be a good thing to do. Um, again, it's like, could we ever achieve the sort of economic momentum to do that? I haven't seen it yet, but it couldn't hide. Um, and you know, I did a lot of um, work around Asian carp. Asian carp turned out to be delicious. Um, a great chef named Peter Hoffman, who had an amazing restaurant in New York for many years called Savoy, he made these baby back Asian carp ribs. Uh, one of the problems with Asian carps is they have the weird bone running through the filet, and so he figured it out. So you'd have the bone sticking out, and you'd munch it off. Um, just one side story about Asian carp. So I have, there's a guy named Paul Hartfield who, who works in the Mississippi Valley, and he, um, he loves Asian carp. And the way he goes fishing for Asian carp is he drives his boat, and the fish literally jump into the boat. He, his wife 
got hit in the head so many times that she made him buy her a football helmet. So she wears a football helmet <laughs> and she cowers at the back of the boat. And that's, that's a day's fishing for the Hartfields. That's a, that's a good fishing story. Yeah, of all know, the fishing stories yeah, you know, out there, that's I a mean, pretty good one. Oh, what a fight he put up. He jumped all the way into the boat. <laughs> Um, we have another question here. It says, systems change is great, but what about small family farms and the impact on their communities? What alternatives would they have? I, I don't know uh, exactly everything the question asker is asking, but potentially small family farms that grow things like beef or pork. You know, there is an awful lot of, uh, of that work being done, much more of that work, frankly, in a place like New England than there used to be. Right. What happens to them? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a trade-off, and I have to say, you know, anytime you start crunching numbers and doing life what are called life cycle analyses, you run into these thorny problems about, well, what happens if the family farm goes out of business and it gets turned into a Best Buy and it's like cement and all the water's rushing off and, you know. So I do think we need to fight for family farms. Um, but I do think that, you know, so in the climate change and the climate diet book that I wrote, one of the sort of 50 rules is um, eat locally logically. Um, I think we have to be careful about kind of the 40 mile round trip to the um, green market so that we can buy one head of broccoli. We've just basically nuked our entire sort of carbon budget by making that drive for that, that head of broccoli. So those kinds of things, eating in season is makes a lot of sense. And yeah, you know, again, I often think about sort of like, you know, look at the American diet and the amount of beef and chicken that we eat. Um, and then look at what the planet can handle, mm -hmm. you know, and look at the way sort of traditional farms used to be structured, right, where there'd be a, a cow or two or a pig or two. So, like, that's kind of what works for us health-wise. It's kind of what works environment-wise, a little bit of meat, you know what I mean? So I don't really have a problem with somebody eating beef or pork from a family farm if they're not do supplementing their other beef eating. So why not just cut it all way back, and the little bit you have is going to come from the family farm. I think on the other end, there's the question of more big chains, whether they're Amazon-owned Whole Foods or Walmart getting into more organically farmed foods, more locally grown <coughs> foods even. Mm -hmm. So you have this, this, I think, problem that a lot of people have um, intellectually, emotionally with the idea that, well... I could shop at the local farmer's market in which everything is super expensive and I might have to drive 40 miles, or I could go to one of the, you know, three Whole Foods that I, I can see, you know, yeah. a couple miles from my house in, uh, in Connecticut and get food that is maybe organically farmed, maybe sustainably fished, but I'm subsidizing a company yeah. that has gigantic server farms somewhere else polluting the environment. I yeah. mean, that's a trade-off. <laughs> it is a trade-off. And, you know, I think we all have to make our decisions with what's going to work for us economically as well. Um, but I do think um, having a certain portion of our dollars going directly to, you know, it, it's a question of how many hands is your food passing through before um, it gets back to the farmer or to the fisher. And schemes that are possibilities that allow to reduce the number of hands. I mean, take fish, for example. The average piece of fish changes hands about seven times. Mm -hmm. So then the more that we can reduce those hand changes, the better. Now, I know it's asking a lot of busy people to orient their way towards a local farm. But, you know, I think having that just be one, at least one part of our diet is a start. Here's a question that's near and dear to my heart. Yeah. What do we do about cheese, climate-wise? Well, cheese is kind of a disaster, uh, climate-wise. Yeah, I'm sorry to everyone's say. Everyone's going to turn this off. Everyone's going to leave the theater. No, I mean, well. People love their cheese. I mean, you know, um, when, I was, when I was talking with one of these big life cycle analyses people, and he was like, and he had read an early draft of the climate diet, and he's like, what about a, what about a line called, cut the cheese? And I was like, okay, we could put that in there. Um, so... All right, so just all I'm saying is, you know, beef, 27 kilos of carbon emissions per kilo of beef. Cheese is about 13.5. It's actually more than pork and more than chicken. So, again, you know, should, what, what about putting cheese in, I'm sorry to be such a Europhile, but what about this, just that nice little sampler of cheese you have occasionally at the end of a nice meal? You know what I mean? Why not good cheese? Why not a little bit of good cheese? I, I don't know. I think that's, 
the way to compromise on all these things. I think it's just, the thing I think, the reason I put it in the book and the reason I pointed out cheese is that there are so many, like, who here remembers Molly Katz and, and the Moosewood Cookbook? Oh, I'm, I'm dating, I still have it at home. Exactly, I, I date myself, <laughs> but you know, like, you look at that, it's just like cut cheese, cheese, broccoli with cheese, this with cheese, and you're like, Molly, dial back on the cheese a little bit, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like, if you're, tr you know, and fair enough to Molly, like, it, we didn't know at the time what a burden cheese was, but the dairy industry is impactful because it comes from cows. And so now that we know what we know, let's just kind of, again, it's really about not so much of eliminating cheese so much as it is moving vegetables more to the center of the plate. You, you wrote a whole book about this, and I, we, sh we need to get back to this omega-3 fatty acid uh, piece. Sure. Because, I, look, I think the, the question of salmon as part of your diet, say, yep. uh, a lot of people quite some time ago said, look, I have read that having this much fish in my diet is good for me. It allows me to get omega-3 fatty acids into my body, which maybe helps my brain, helps me in some other way. How much of what we believed about omega-3 fatty acids is kind of bunk now? How much of it is really true? What should we know about these things? I think if you have two portions of oily fish a week, you're good. Um, I'm not a huge fan of supplements in general. Uh, I spend a lot of time looking at the supplement industry. I think there's great variation from pill to pill. Um, I think our children should be having oily fish or some, you know, whether it's anchovies, whether it's, you know, I actually make a sauce call, I call toucan sauce, um, which is, it's not made out of toucans. It's made out of a can of tomato sauce and a full can of anchovies that I dissolve into the sauce. And that was something I fed my kid very early on. He didn't, couldn't even really taste the anchovy in the sauce. So finding ways to, I think the omega-3 issue is, is important for children. Um, I do believe it is a key point towards building brains. The whole thing that we, as adults of a certain age, worry about is cardiovascular health. And the evidence there is a little bit kind of, you know, it, it, it's, we've seen a lot of studies before and for and against. Um, one thing, you know, I, I like to point out in the omega-3 conversation is that half of all uh, patients first report heart disease to their doctors by dropping dead. Um, you know, sudden cardiac death is um, a huge cause of death um, within the panoply of ways that you can die. And actually, when they look at all the different ways that omega-3s can help you, actually sudden cardiac death, which is different from um, coronary artery disease, but sudden cardiac death actually does seem to have a near mm. significant effect. If you, Omega-3s do have an effect in lowering the chance of just dropping dead. Hey, and the reason I ask about that in a, in a talk that is primarily about climate change is look, we, we end up eating more farmed salmon because yeah. it is it is plentiful, it is cheap, yeah, and in part because we think it's really, really good for us, and it's displacing in our diet maybe the beef or the pork or something that we used to eat. Yeah. That is one of the changes. It's one of the reasons why you can easily get the cheap farmed salmon. Yeah. But as you've pointed out, it causes a bit of environmental disaster. It's not as good for you. It's certainly part of a climate problem. I guess I'm just wondering, reconciling that piece of it, here's something that people have grown up now for quite some time thinking is really good for your diet, really good to feed your kids, but it's not something that we should be, frankly, subsidizing or eating. Well, so, you know, first of all, I, I don't think I said it's necessarily bad for you. So farmed salmon has pretty high omega-3s because they can actually tweak that, you know, because they're feeding sure, it. Sure. They can put all the fish oil they want in it and make it pretty high. So farm salmon are actually quite high in omega-3 fatty acids. There was a scare a number of years ago that farm salmon was higher in PCBs. Um, that has actually gone down over the years because they're feeding less of northern hemisphere fish meal to those salmon. They're feeding them more vegetable pr protein. Um, and as a result, that has gone down. So I don't think it's um, a bad thing from a health perspective to have in your diet. From a climate perspective, it's hard to get companies to kind of give you transparent numbers on life cycle analyses of farmed fish. But as far as I can tell, talking to different people looking at it, the climate impact of farmed salmon is probably somewhere between a pig and a chicken. So, you know, it's, you know, wild salmon is really low climate impact because to harvest them is super, super low. Obviously, there's a limited amount of wild salmon out there. So I'm not you know, fully against salmon aquaculture, but I just feel like there are other ways that we can kind of pursue this omega-3 line than just endlessly pumping up the farm fish industry.
We have another question here about uh, cashew and almond milk and what it does to the environment using a great deal of, of water. This is certainly something that we've yeah. read about in recent years. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, uh, I'm not a fan of the almond milk and the cashew milk. And it is, you know, especially since a lot of it's coming from the West Coast, where we do know there's fires, there's aquifer, almost elimination at this point. Um, I do like, I mean, puts me in a certain box, but I'm a fan of oat milk and oats for a number of reasons. So it's interesting when you look at um, histories of crops planted in the Midwest over the last 150 years, oats were actually used to be quite high. Why? Fed the horses. Um, so as horse labor went down, oat production went down. But oats actually are really important in the sort of ecosystem of the farm. Oats are an early crop and they hold the soil in place. So, you know, a lot of the runoff that we're getting that's causing these dead zones and nitrogen runoff is because we don't have cover crops in place to hold soil in place during the rainy season. So increasing oat production on American land is probably a really good idea. So if I were going to choose a plant-based milk to, chew, to drink, I would, I would drink oat milk. Uh, somebody has a question here uh, about um, the suffering of chickens. There's no way to stop the suffering of chickens yeah. except to stop eating them. It's a bigger problem than climate change, uh, th this person says. Look, I, so I work for Science Friday. We just got done with a week of programming that we call Cephalopod Week. And, and Cephalopod Week is a cel it's the antidote to Shark Week, and, it, and it's, a, it's a celebration of octopus and squid, these remarkable creatures that we're learning are incredibly intelligent, and they're fascinating, and they're, they're made very different than us. Yeah. Thinking about this, because the question always comes up after a cephalopod talk, do you eat octopus anymore? Yeah. Because they're so damn smart, they're so amazing in all the ways. This question of eating sentient beings, yeah. be they fish, squid, or chickens, is something that plays into this somehow. Yeah. How do you think about it? Well, first of all, I don't eat octopus anymore. You um, don't? Um, and you, I actually was commissioned to do a whole sort of retrospective on the history of the octopus. And do you know there was this phase, it's, it's, I mean, it's this is a little bit of a digression, but I, why not? Um, there was a period, so um, aquariums came about in the mid-19th century because the glass tax in England was eliminated. And so suddenly started building aquariums. And suddenly people started putting octopus in aquariums, partly because um, lots of different authors started writing about them. Victor Hugo wrote a, a book called the Les Trailleurs de Mer or something like that, but about a giant octopus. So people became so obsessed with it that there was a trend called cephalomania, where people, everybody, and, 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 and uh, the, the, the keeper of the uh, Brighton Aquarium said, having an aquarium without an octopus was like having a plum pudding without plums. So, <laughs> but I believe all the stories about octopus. I do think they're really interesting. I don't eat them anymore. Um, I do think they're delicious, sorry to say, but I don't eat them anymore. If, you know, if, it's some, if a dead one ended on my plate. But to the more important question about <laughs> sentience and so forth, to me, that is a very big issue. Um, and the problem with chickens, you know, from a kind of like this versus that, situation is that chickens are just so damn efficient. Like, you know, you can grow a chicken in a couple of months. And to grow a chicken in a couple of months is horrible. Like, it's horrible for the chicken. So it's like, it's very good from a climate perspective in terms of, you know, compared to other meats, but it's very horrible for the chicken. So if we want to take that into account, of course we don't eat the chicken. And again, I'm saying, let's move to the plant-based thing in the center. And if we're going to, you know, if we're going to eat things that have suffered, let's eat a minimum of those things that have suffered, and let's try to find the things that suffered the least as mm -hmm. part of our diet. Again, it goes back to that equation that what nature tells us, what suffering tells us, what climate tells us, is that just a little bit of meat, if we're mm -hmm. going to have it at all. And I, I do think it touches on that sentience issue. Now, if you want to go full on everything sentient thing, you know, as the Russians say, Pozhalsta, I mean, go for it and <laughs> let's just move on. And that's a perfectly valid argument. But I think, unfortunately, a good 80% of America doesn't agree with you at this point. Uh, following along those lines, and, and maybe it's another uh, squid-related question here, but um, I was telling you backstage, we recently did a story on Science Friday about a, a study that was conducted about the, the menus of restaurants over the last couple hundred years mm -hmm. and looking at those restaurant menus to sort of see the impact of climate change on our fisheries, what sorts of fish were on the menu. And it's, of course, changed rapidly over time. Yeah. Given the research that you've done for, for these books, especially around <coughs> four fish, 
do you expect that we will be eating something different from the sea because of the impacts of climate change, regardless of fishing policies, regardless of, of anything else, just because it becomes the most abundant species? Saying this because I, I, I heard from both scientists and chefs that Humboldt squid, which was never on anybody's menu, is on more people's menus because climate change has put it in the zone of more of more fishermen. Yep. Do you see this change happening? All yeah, time? I mean, so I grew up on Long Island Sound, and I grew up fishing on Long Island Sound, and I would say that Long Island Sound species profile is more and more resembling the Chesapeake. Mm -hmm. You know, we in the springtime we used to have winter flounder. Now we have summer flounder, different species. We used to net, we used to have tom cod, um, things like that in Long Island Sound. Now we have black sea bass, again, mid-Atlantic species. We used to have lobster in Western Long Island Sound. Now we have blue crabs, again, a Chesapeake species. And so, and I think we're gonna see the Gulf of Maine becoming more and more like, like Long Island Sound. And basically we're gonna see things moving further and further up. I have a, my good friend Carl Safina, you know, I was asking him, he lives out in the far end of Long Island. And I said, man, he's like, you know, pushing 70 and, you know, probably not in the mood to move at this point. And I said, I said, Carl, what do you think? I mean, water's going to rise. I mean, are you thinking of leaving Long Island? He goes, he goes nope. I'm going to wait right here for the yellowfin and the wahoo. <laughs> <laughs> so they're that's coming. what we, that they're coming. You know, and we are seeing weird stuff, lots of weird stuff. Um, you know, Sheepshead Bay, um, which was once named for Sheepshead, is starting, which Sheepshead Porgy from the south, yeah. is we're starting to see Sheepshead in Sheepshead Bay again in yeah. Brooklyn. So. Uh, and you mentioned this a bit in your talk, but I, I think it's important to note that the wind farms that are, you know, coming to Long Island Sound, coming to the waters off the Cape, the, the very little time that we've had around these turbines that are just off of Block Island, scientists have found that actually a whole bunch of really interesting sea life is growing up around them. Now, the fishermen, the, the commercial fishermen in hate this them. area hate them yeah. because they have to navigate through them. Commercial fishermen, I think, will have a lot of problems navigating around all of these offshore wind farms. But there is some really interesting stuff that you can do and that even naturally happens around these stanchions out in the ocean. I mean, you know, anytime you create structure in the water, you, life tends to congregate around it. Um, and then, of course, if you put uh, wind farms in place, you've created a trawl-free zone, essentially. That said, the jury is out. There's a lot of stuff that goes on, especially when we build wind, wind farms at scale. Um, there's some worries that you create the different hydrodynamics, different temperature dynamics that could, if you take enough wind out of the system, you could potentially alter the temperature structure of the ocean below. So I think there's more studying that has to go on. Um, I actually do empathize with, with fishermen. I do think that the wind companies need to be more collaborative with them when they put these farms in. So to me, it's a work in progress. We just have about a minute left. If, if you have a couple minutes to, to talk to someone who is skeptical that their individual choices, whether it's in their kitchen, in the supermarket, or <coughs> wherever, can do anything about the, the problems of climate change, what do you tell them? Well, I do say that there is this overarching federal need and governmental need to change things. But I don't think you should do nothing. I mean, one of the big central questions at the beginning of the Climate Diet book is should we do something or should we do nothing? Clearly, we can't do nothing. And so, <coughs> by and large, I try to emphasize these 50 things that you could do that have systems change effects. Whether it's investing, moving your investments from the regular S&P that has all these oil companies in it to SPYX, which is fossil free whether it's changing from gas to electric in your kitchen, whether it's changing your electricity provider. Bit by bit, that is something. And I think at the end of our lives, to be able to have said that we did something instead of nothing is important. Before we go, I just want to say something that I say each year when I host one of these, these talks at the International Festival of Arts and Ideas. Uh, the city of New Haven does something really remarkable by putting this festival on each year. And don't for a minute um, take it for granted. Not many communities have something like this that goes on, that, that blends together arts and ideas, uh, talks like this one with concerts that are free in the park. So thank you so much to the city. Thank you to the festival uh, for bringing this conversation together. Thanks to Connecticut Humanities for helping to support it. And thanks so much for the conversation. I really appreciate My it. My pleasure, Don. Really a lot of fun. Thank you. <coughs> and if you are interested, 
Look, it's right there. The table to sign books is right down in front. So if you want to come down and ask some questions and get a book signed, uh, please join us down here. Please have a very good evening. Drive home safe. And if you're at home, thank you for watching. Thank you. Thanks, John.